Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's your boy, the Gilbert Ival of Not Quite Liable, Jack Slack, and it's Fight Gone by episode 91. Coming at you on the 24th of July, the hottest day of the year in the UK. This is miserable. I really hope global climate change warming stuff doesn't make this the normal for me in the future. Uh, I mean, I would be able to grow grapes as they did in the mini warming period of the Middle Ages or whatever it was, but I don't think that would make up for constantly having swamp pass. But then I'm well aware that my audience is entirely American and a lot of them will be in uh, swamp passy regions anyway. Comment below to tell me about your swamp pass. So what's going on in the fight world? Well, we had an event. Um, it was shit. Uh, it was really not a good event. But we've got some good stuff coming up this weekend um, with uh, a UFC event, which is surprisingly good. And I almost completely ignored it because I saw there's a Ryzen card coming up. And Ryzen, I just enjoy. Like, you know, uh, no apologies there. They do do some shit fights and some shitty matchmaking. And the ring is objectively worse than the cage from a sporting perspective. And they do waste the time of guys like Kyoji Horiguchi. Uh, they, they did give him good opponents, you know, but I, I would rather see him in the UFC fighting the best. But their events are really entertaining, you know, that's all there is to it. And they do few enough of them that they break up the calendar quite nicely. So when you see one coming, you go, oh, that's nice. It's like a little celebration. As opposed to the constant barrage of UFC and Bellator events. And 1FC, they're always doing events, and I know none of their fighters. So what's going on in the news? Um, Alexander Gustafsson was, lost his opponent for UFC 227. Who was that again? Oh, that was Volkan Ustamir, who they took off the card with Shogun, probably for the best, as it turns out. Um, and now Gustafsson has no opponent. Uh, Khalil Roundtree offered to step in, having starched Gogan Saki without taking a single good punch the other month. Well, no, the other week, actually. But for some reason, that fight was, was panned, but they're going to look for another opponent for Gustafsson. I don't know if that... No one said anything about... Roundtree not being medically cleared, so I, I'm guessing they just said, no, we don't want any of Roundtree. Uh, we'll take a sh an easier opponent on short notice, please. Because, you know, that that is Gustafson's problem. Uh, uh, Anthony Johnson, DC, maybe John Jones, but all of these guys, Black Explosive, you know, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to fight another Black Explosive fighter on short notice. Black Explosive t-shirts coming soon, by the way. They actually look really good. But yeah, that's, that's an interesting pickle that they're in now, because they specifically pulled Volkan Ustamir to put him on that card and now he's not on that card and we're like two weeks out week and a half out and they don't have an alternative on the plus side you've already got two title fights in the in the main and co-main but you don't want to then be oh hang on nope it, apparently Gustafsson has pulled out as well that happened two days ago I missed that entirely didn't write that on my news schedule um so yeah that's off the card so Jesus Christ <laughs> the official main card is TJ versus Gar Garbrandt good fight we've seen it before but good fight Demetrius Johnson versus Henry Cejudo, decent enough fight, you know, for what you can make at flyweight. Uh, and then Pollyanna Viana versus JJ Aldrich. What the fuck is that for a main card fight? And then Cub Swanson versus Hanato Moicano. I like Hanato Moicano. I like Cub Swanson, but that's probably a, a bit of a softball for Moicano, unless Swanson comes out really surprisingly uh, fired up. And then the prelims card has got Betch Kohea versus Irene Ivory Aldant. Jesus fucking Christ. Um... Yeah, what is with the rest of that card? Under 200,000 buys, do we reckon? We did it the other the other week. I think it might be a little... We're going to have to try really hard to do it again. But Alexander Gustafsson brings us on to the constant trail of call-outs around Daniel Cormier, the light heavyweight and heavyweight champion. It's assumed that if they get this Lesnar fight together, he will take the Lesnar fight and he will retire. Uh, he's probably not coming back down. He's gained 40 pounds. He's probably not coming back down to light heavyweight, especially when there's no one to fight there. Um, Gustafson can keep calling people out, but he's not been in the ring in 15 months. So, um, you know, what, <laughs> what more could you do? Uh, but the hilarious one, Ilya Latifi, you'll remember he called DC out on Instagram the other week. And we had a good laugh about that because Ilya Latifi is bringing nothing to that matchup. No one is tuning in for Ilya Latifi. Maybe some sad Swedish bloke is, is tuning in. But even they would rather see Gustafsson versus, uh, versus uh, DC. But yeah, Ilya Latifi tried to sell himself as the money fight, then pulled out of his fight on Sunday, and on Monday called DC out again like DC was ducking him and he deserved it. Um, just sad, really. Just really, it was like, oh, you're trying so hard. Are you, are you really hard up for money? Is that what's happening? <laughs> so... Um, 
just tragic. I, who is going to tune in to see Ilya Latifi? I avoid Ilya Latifi even when he's on a main card because I was stung by fucking Ilya Latifi versus Jan Volante. Um, I would almost rather watch Jan Volante versus DC because at least maybe he'd try and kick him or something. Even though Jan Volante is also, also horrible to watch. Other news. The Anderson Silva versus Israel Adesanya fight uh, crawls forward. Anderson Silva came out today saying that he doesn't know who Israel Adesanya is. Um... Quick control F for Prime through these threads and you'll get like a thousand results. People just getting their excuses in in case the fight does happen so that they can be like, well, in his prime, Anderson would have beaten Adesanya. And you're like, well, these people who think that have no idea what they're watching, to be honest. Like, you know, you can look at Israel Adesanya and even without the kickboxing accolades, you can watch him in the cage and you know that he's a better striker than anyone Silver fought. Vitor Belfort is the best fight striker that Silver fought and Vitor Belfort's whole game is being really explosive. He is not a good technical striker or a tactician. Uh, Israel Adesanya, someone said to me on Twitter, threw, uh, showed more feints in one round of his last fight than Anderson Silva had to contend with in his entire career. Uh, Israel Adesanya is a rough matchup for Anderson Silva. And, you know, Anderson Silva could fight him and win, and that would be more impressive to me than any of the striking performances that he had in his career. Especially if he does it at an advanced age. You know, I'm, I'm prepared to say that. Like, if he beats Adesanya, I would be like, wow, that is a much better striker than anyone you fought. Well done, and you did it at 40-something. And perhaps you passed the drug test. Um, but I th- think at, the, at this time, I, Izzy was calling for the fight, but I think that is a waste of his time. Because, firstly, there's a chance that Anderson Silva pops before you get there anyway. But secondly, even if you crush him, people will go, well, five years ago... You know, oh, when he was jabbing up Yushiro Kami, that's when he'd have boxed up uh, Israel Adesanya. Oh, God. It, this this sport is getting to the level where um, boxing is. Like, I clicked on t- the other day, I was doing some stuff on Jack Sharkey, which you can read at Vice. Um, I clicked on the fight between Jack Sharkey and Mickey Walker. Mickey Walker was this chubby uh, middleweight like Bulldog, who went up to heavyweight and, and went to decision with some heavyweights, but wasn't, like, tremendous. And the comments are just full of, this guy would crush Hagler. Uh, can you imagine a fat Roberto Duran getting to decision with Mickey Walker? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> just like, I'm watching this guy. He is not a patch on Marvin Hagler. You know, there's respecting things from the past and appreciating good stuff that was done in the past. And then there's just being delusional. Things do get better over time. Oh, and he said he was better than Ray Robinson, too, which was fucking hilarious. This fat white dude. <laughs> just, well, I mean, his whiteness has no bearing on it, but he was just a fat dude with tits uh, doing the heavy bag. What else is happening? Um, Eddie Alvarez is fighting the last fight of his contract against Poirier on, is that Saturday night? Uh, the, the upcoming UFC event. Uh, the much... Uh, anticipated rematch between the two after the very controversial first fight. Eddie Alvarez looked to be on his way to... Well, you know, you never know with Eddie Alvarez because he's hurt in almost every fight. But uh, he was stumbling and uh, there was a knee that was... Was it ruled illegal or something like that? Became a no contest. They've been trying for ages to get the uh, rematch together. They have the rematch now. And Alvarez is obviously in the dangerous position where if he loses, he's got to negotiate his contract immediately after that. If he wins, that's awesome, you know, but... I think it's a dangerous move if you want to bid with if you want to try and um, drive up the UFC's bid because in that division with it moving so slowly at the top and there being so many good fighters, uh, you know, a win over Poirier here, it doesn't make him indispensable in the division. They could just ignore him. They could say, well, no, we're going to do Poirier versus uh, Kevin Lee now, and if Kevin Lee beats Poirier, cool, he's next for title shot. Or Poirier versus Tony Ferguson, or you just do Tony Ferguson versus Kevin Lee too, or something like that. You know, there's, there's so many ways you can get around giving a guy what he's worth in a division with that many top names in. Uh, so very dangerous. I personally, I mean, Alvarez has already won the title. He's sort of slowing down. Um, it would be nice to see him drive up the bids and then go to Bellator you know, and, and fight softer competition generally. I mean, obviously Michael Chandler's there and he gave him a great fight, well, two great fights, Um but outside of that, you know, there's there's not an awful lot of talent in that lightweight division that's that's on par with the top lightweights in the UFC. But because so many people want to believe there are, you know, you can you can convince those Bellator fans that yeah, I'm definitely 
the Alter Rex. I'm the actual best lightweight in the world. If I were in that UFC division, I'd be at the top now. I'm in a career resurgence. <laughs> well, which is what uh, Gagard Musassi is doing now with his uh, middleweight career. There's no one for him to fight in Bellator, but he'll continue crushing nobodies. And people will be like, well, he's at the best stage in his career. If, if this Musassi was in the UFC, he'd be the actual champion. So while taking a big shit over that idea, I do respect it. And I want uh, Eddie Alvarez to do that because I want him to make lots of money and win some fights. Easier fights. Not get hit in the head so much. Piece of news out of the Twilight Zone this week. Uh, <laughs> Antonio Ruggiero Nogueira returns to fight Sam Alvey at UFC Sao Paulo in September. Uh, and this was strange because almost everyone thought that Ruggiero Nogueira was retired. He's just n not been around forever. And his last few fights were depressing, so we assumed he was retired. Let's have a look at what Roger Nog's been up to. Well, he's 42 years old, so there's that for a start. But um, came into the UFC... Beat Luis Banya Kane in a fight which I made some money on because I knew that he could box and Kane couldn't. Uh, God, do you remember Luis Banya Kane? People were obsessed with him for like a couple of months. There was a picture someone made up which was a wheel of like lightweight, light heavyweight talent in the UFC. So there was like a young John Jones, a young Ryan Bader, and Sokaju and Luis Banya Kane. And some of them went on to be great, but a lot of them just crashed out and weren't anything. And that's how we got to the light heavyweight division we have now. God, do you remember when that was the most exciting division in MMA? Um, lost to Ryan Bader, lost to Phil Davis. Uh, got that win over Tito Ortiz by hitting him in the body, because Tito Ortiz has a glass body, apparently. Downward elbows to the body. That was something that Shogun did to him in their first fight really effectively. Uh, and then he brought it into that Tito Ortiz fight and knocked him out with it, or TKO'd him with it. Very impressive. Uh, in fact, if you, I mean, we did this in the in the history episode on that Pride Grand Prix, but if you haven't seen their first fight, firstly, what are you doing with your life? That's like uh, first ballot entry to Hall of Fame of Great Fights, the Shogun Nogueira won. Um, but if you haven't seen that fight, a lot of what Shogun's doing that is tiring Nogueira out is dropping elbows on his midsection from guard and dropping these really high hammer fists because without um, elbows to the head being legal, you really have to strip your hand free and bring it above your head and drop it down on them, um, which makes for interesting ground and pound. Uh, not always the best ground and pound, but certainly interesting. Oh my god, do you remember he got that fight with Rashad Evans, which was a gimme for Rashad. They were trying to like get Rashad back in the win column after the John Jones fight, and they gave him Ruggiero Nogueira, Dan Hen the ghost of Dan Henderson and Chael Middleweight Sonnen back to back and only one of those did he manage to do without any like um, danger to him he managed to lose the Ruggiero one by not actually fighting uh, and then Dan Henderson dropped him with a jab a jab from Dan Henderson yeah <laughs> and then he fought Chael and, and mounted him and smashed him because Chael's not anything more than a middleweight really um, which is why he's it's been so interesting watching him in this tournament because these dudes he's fighting at are old enough that he can get away with it even though every previous time he's been up to light heavyweight he goes actually I'm not a light heavyweight and then goes back down again but anyway so then he fought um, Anthony Johnson obviously that was horrible got starched in 40 seconds but it felt like much longer and I'm pretty sure he was reeling the entire time um, and then he fought Shogun a year later and then he fought Patrick Cummins a year after that and won by TK. I do not remember that happening. And then he got knocked out by Bader when Bader was still in the UFC. That was his last fight in November 2016. So he's been out of the game for fucking ever. And he didn't have a drug violation or anything like that. Oh, no, he did have a drug violation. I completely forgot that. He was set to face um, Jared Cannon. And he, oh, God, that would have been awful for him, too. <laughs> at UFC on Fox 26. Uh, however, he was pulled from the belt in October 2017 after being flagged by USADA for here we go hydrochlorothiazide yes <laughs> whatever that does he was on that um yeah i mean just sad just sad that this guy's still going sad that the ufc is still giving him fights is this fight even oh in sao paulo yeah that explains it then get the old brazilians on and then the final piece of news was that jds versus ivanov that card peaked at 800,000 viewers which i think was 850,000 viewers but it was actually pretty good compared to what the recent standard has been um well, thus <laughs> i suppose confirming that sage is still a draw god knows why i think he's big in the bodybuilder community or the twink community who knows the child molest Jomos. Jomos love Sage Northcutt. There we go. That's the community that's watching that. Big demographic for MMA. Anyway, that's the news out of the way. Oh, God, we've been, like, going for 20 minutes. Let's talk about the fights that happened and uh, why they weren't great. <laughs> right, so this was fight night 
one three four god we've done a lot of these uh shogun versus smith and it was being held in hamburg uh, you'll remember it was the card that they felt comfortable taking vulcan Ustimir off after advertising him um which was super fucking shady because i feel like card liable to change should be about injuries on that card i, I don't think it should be about actual bait and switch which is what this was um or appeared to be i don't there's probably a legal definition of bait and switch but certainly it it recalled bait and switch in my mind when i when i heard about it or when it happened because i heard about it when it happened because i'm on the irish whatsapp group get in on that if you want to get in on the on the big scoops but uh hamburg germany couple of german fighters i was impressed by david zawada i got pissed at him uh pissed off at him rather we say in england uh during my live tweeting of this event yes i live tweeted it uh you wouldn't have known because you probably have been asleep or would you what were america doing you were probably getting up for the day but i never get to live tweet events unless i stay up really i think the last time i properly stayed up until like 5 a.m was i don't know the last time i can remember was doing um silver versus wideman 2 because i had a load of people over i specifically remember that because the first kick he checked i went oh that's a good check and then immediately after he broke silver's leg um but oh god there must be a, a more recent one when was the strike force grand prix oh, i must have done one since but it'll probably be because i couldn't sleep rather than i stayed up all night to enjoy it um yeah, it doesn't happen as, much, as often as it should. I normally watch the first few fights and then go, Jesus Christ, I am not the young man I once was. I cannot stay up until 5 a.m. watching fights and then sleep three hours and then go and do something. Um, but yeah, it was really nice having this. That's another reason why I love Rising, which I forgot to say. Sunday morning at croissant time. What could you not love about that? But what did I see? Did not watch Stasiak because I assumed he was related to Sean Stasiak. <laughs> but... Anything interesting stood out from this card? Oh, I watched um, Emil Weber Meek versus uh, Bartosz Fabinski. Fabinski? Yeah, Fabinski from Poland. Um, and like the the nights, I was on some live chat, so I had read it up and I had Twitter up, and I you know I was just keeping an eye on what people were saying. Um, and <laughs> it started out with people being like, "Oh, why do they always give him wrestlers? It's so unfair to his style." And then by about round two, well, actually after the first time he got up from a takedown, you realise that it wasn't the fact that he was facing wrestlers; uh, it was the way that he was fighting that was costing him the fight. Like even not a very good wrestler had complete access to his hips at all time because uh, Emil Verbomik he only ever runs forward, swing in one twos. You know, left, right, left, right. Never does anything different, never takes a step back and considers the situation, never throws a feint. Just co like, I get that your thing is being a berserker, but even when constantly going forward, you could throw some different punches or throw an elbow or throw a knee, you know, <laughs> but it just did the same thing over and over again. And, you know, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different res results is uh, the definition of madness. So says my motivational cat poster. I think Meek, like, He's clearly gigantic at that weight, which is awesome. He's got a skill in cutting weight, and he hits decently hard, but he couldn't, like, he needs to do something about how he fights. You know, take a step back, throw a couple of kicks, pump a, an oblique kick in the, fr in the front of his knee. You know, have him reaching for stuff, have him worrying about stepping in on you immediately, because all uh, Fabinski had to do was duck every time <laughs> Meek did anything. Um, and then Meek was elbowing the shit out of Fabinski's brainstem. There were so many illegal elbows in this fight, and obviously he did it to Palharis, and because we're really kind on what we consider uh, 12 to 6 elbows, I think the whole thing is like the 12 to 6 elbow thing is mainly to protect elbows to the back of the head, because that's the, the easy... When you take someone into like no-holds-barred barred rules for the first time, that's the first thing they're going to do as soon as someone tries to take them down. Uh, Branko Sikadich, for instance. But I think by allowing people to just lean a bit forward and, and throw them down sideways, you are also making it harder for you to call actual elbows to the back of the head. You know, even when Travis Brown was doing them, he was landing those ones that are technically legal, but he'd land an illegal one in the middle, and only one elbow to the fucking back of the head is enough to ruin your night. <laughs> you know, so I, I think by opening up the interpretation of it, they've ruined calling that rule. Um, for what it was intended for. Now, feel free to hit me up with ex explanations about breaking blocks of ice, but, you know, if we just did call a little bit more aggressively elbows of the downward style, you know, even if they're going, if you're leaning forward so they're going from two to seven or whatever it is, um, if we called those illegal, then we would have a lot less elbows to the back of the head generally. But they are happening all the time at the moment. Also, Kevin Starkey fucking sucks as a referee, so... Uh, there's that. <laughs>
Hein versus Hadzovic. Um, I thought Hadzovic's jab looked good. I thought Hein looked like he wanted to just walk straight through that jab. <laughs> it just really showed you that there isn't really, like, you can walk through the jab, but you can't physically walk through the jab. You can't evaporate his bones as you walk into it. <laughs> you can grit your teeth and try and make your way in immediately after the jab and things like that, but you're still taking the jab square on the face. You're not going to be able to just collapse his his hand against your head. Then the actual... I'm just looking down the card. I think this is my... Yeah, this is my fight of the night. Um, Nazrat Hakparast. No idea. Your guess is as good as mine. Versus Mark Jacquesi. And I went into this fight being like, yep, Mark Jacquesi. He'll get some hype back on himself here because, you know, he lost some in the Dan Hooker fight because Hooker really drew him out, made him make bad decisions and so on. Uh, this was the complete opposite of that fight, but Jacquesi got put through the woodwork again. Through the woodwork? Is that a thing? I normally say through the meat grinder. He got battered, basically. But uh, Nazrat, who we're going to call Mini Kelvin Gastelum. Actually, Nazrat's probably easier. But Nazrat walked him down from the get-go, put him on the fence, gave him really very few clean chances to spin or do big fancy counters. And when uh, Jacquesi was swinging overhands and stuff, you know, Jacquesi's boxing isn't the best. And Nazrat was beating him to the punch on most of these exchanges, countering the um, lead hooks over the top and so on. A uh, couple of good body shots in there. I thought he just looked absolutely brilliant. I'll, I'm going to have to watch it again because I was you know, caught up in drinking tea and, and being snarky on Twitter at the same time. But I thought he looked really, really good. Like I, for most people forgot he had one fight in the UFC. I'd forgot he had one fight in the UFC against um, Martin Held, who's now gone. But I thought that was a little bit of an early cut because he is a good fighter, Martin Held. Um, but yeah, this could have been his debut because he just he didn't exist, and now he does. <laughs> That's how I felt about this fight, you know. Danny Roberts versus David Zawada. I had money on Zawada, so I was a little bit pissy about him losing, but I thought he looked fi- fun enough, fun enough. Clearly a grappler. He was rolling for those, um, is it a mask or a slas? I think it's a slas because you di- you're diving, but just a dance where you dive through onto your back like a baseball slide. When Because Rob- Roberts does tire quite badly, and he makes bad decisions when he's tired. Um, and that was really obvious against uh, Mike Perry. When he's in trouble, he's not very smart with what he does. Uh, he'll shoot like an awful takedown with his head way out in front of him and looking down. Um, and he did that here. And that was in the third round, I think. And Zawada sprawled on him, started rolling for the darts. It looked good-ish. And then uh, Roberts made sure to keep the underhook with the, the arm that was in the darts. Uh, and then he abandoned it, came up on top of the sprawl again, and then rolled for the same thing again. Uh, he, was just, he was going, please just go to his back or something. Don't keep going. But obviously that must be one of his specialties in training doesn't seem to have won any fights due to Dars on his record apparently but it was a nice attempt regardless um very cool form of Dars. Uh, there's basically two ways to do it you snap them down and get them onto their side with like a, a three-quarter nelson you just twist them down onto their side and then punch through for the Dars. or you can uh, slide through so that you're almost going under them and then because you've got their arm pressed against your body as you're going through you can roll them all the way over your back um, and that's the one he was going for I thought Danny Roberts looked decent, but again, tired and did silly things when he was tired. And then in the end, Zawada had him tired and was landing punches in exchanges and then dived for a single leg takedown when the hammer went. And obviously they're both exhausted at that stage, but just stand and bang. The dude's clearly reeling and uh, tired. Don't dive on a takedown when you... Jacare Souza isn't going to go from a single leg takedown to a finish in 10 seconds. Then you had Tabura versus Stefan Struve. This was shit, as expected. I thought I could win some money on Struve because he was 2-1 to one and Martin Tabura is hit and miss. Um, but no, Struve spent the first round in the guard doing nothing. Uh, spent the second round doing nothing. And I was tweeting, throw a jab, you big pink dick. Uh, <laughs> but he threw a couple of jabs and then he started throwing uppercuts. Again. Someone pointed out to me, Stefan Struve is seven foot tall and he got hit by an uppercut. He is an anomaly in fight sports. Uh, he's just, every time I see him, I think, God, I miss Sammy Schilt. That man was so talented. And we we gave him so much shit that he was just tall. And then you see Stefan Struve do this. And you realise, oh, wait, Sammy Schilt was also a really good fighter. Uh, co-main event was Corey Anderson versus Glover Teixeira. That was pretty, meh, dullish. Um, good to see Anderson winning trades with Teixeira because obviously Teixeira's whole thing is throw the overhand and win the trade uh, on power basically uh, it landed good uppercuts on Teixeira as he leaned which we now know is like 
the thing you do against Tishera because uh, Anthony Johnson did it. But it's good to see that coming in MMA more because the overhand was like the answer to everything for the wrestle banger. Uh, but it does expose you to the uppercut. Frankie Edgar versus Uriah Faber is a great example of that. Every time Faber runs in with an uh, with an overhand, Frankie will catch it on his forearm and then come back with like two or three uppercuts to the face. Um, main event, Anthony Smith versus Shogun Hua. Super depressing, but expected. Um, so now Anthony Smith is like the number five light heavyweight in the world, having been an also ran at middleweight. But then that's not to say anything because Robert Whittaker was an also ran at welterweight. You know, he wasn't anything special and now he's the middleweight champion. Uh, guys have to find their right weight to fight at. And if Anthony Smith feels better fighting here, he's clearly showing that he's good. Uh, you know, he might have met some old men at opportune times, but equally, Mauricio Hur had beaten Corey Anderson and, and other guys who were supposed to be hot contenders at light heavyweight. John Vlante. <clears throat> but in the space of just over a month, that means Anthony Smith's knocked out two former light heavyweight champions, uh, which is a good story if you're desperate for some action in that division, which we are. I thought he looked good. It was just big power. He's, he's a big hitter, even at a bigger weight class, because he was always an enormous middleweight. But um... it was sad because it was the Shogun that I wanted to see. You know, I joked oh well he's gonna throw his overhand as soon as they engage and he and you know it's kind of sad because it was the sort of shogun that i wanted to see and have wanted to see for years you know um when he comes out kicking i like that a lot i was joking that during the um pre-fight graphics which are like you know i'm shit at after effects but they aren't much better um they show like his gaze before you know they they show and he's looking here and he's gonna throw the, the whatever um and they showed his gaze and they're showing like him looking at the opponent when he's clearly looking at the floor and throwing the overhand, because that's what he does. Like, as soon as they step in, he looks down and he throws the overhand. Um, but, you know, he did do that in this fight, but he was throwing some kicks to start with, which was nice. I think he dinged Smith a couple of times, but, you know, Smith, as much as he was, like, you know, uh, stopped a couple of times at middleweight, he did take a wheel kick to the face from Tiago Santos in the opening seconds of their fight and then recover from it to fight through until he was stopped later on. Um, so he's a tough dude. And if he can, you know, his chin will probably be better if he's not cutting all that weight. So um, that seems to be what our completely anecdotal findings are, are showing in, in MMA. Guys who cut, who stop cutting weight take punches much better. But anyway, yeah, super sad. Um, one of those stoppages that was kind of horrible because uh, Shogun was clearly her out of it and then he took a load of extra punches on the feet like while still clearly out of it uh, and then just sort of slumped down and then the referee was trying to hold him down on the floor as he was trying to stand up and you know it is important that if someone gets really badly knocked out or you know uh, TKO'd you probably want them to sit down or, or you know, take a rest while the doctor comes in but equally he was clearly trying to stand up and not like fight back and this referee was just riding him like he was Habib Nurmagomedov just a sad sight to be honest reminded me of uh Ovin Simpru versus Shogun when that entire arena of Brazilians just went silent and cleared out before he even started his post-fight interview really if you missed this card you didn't miss an awful lot but it is always nice when you watch one of these cards and you're going god what a shit card and then you see someone like Nazra uh Hack Prast versus uh, Mark Jacasey, and you just think, "Wow, okay, I knew that Jacasey was good, so this guy is clearly very good in his own right, and he's worked out this very good opponent. So I've, you know, now I've got someone I can keep an eye on." Um, you do get rewards for watching these these worse cards. There's a whole heap going on this weekend, so we'll probably, in fact, we will do a, a cheeky Thursday potty um, because I just enjoy doing two in one week. Um, so I'll answer a couple of questions, then I'll get out of here. These are questions that I saved from a couple of weeks ago when I ran out of time. Hello, Sir Jack. You are the Mackenzie Dern of chugging sperm, the Dana White of wet, warm and tight, and the Gary Tonnen of getting a good bone in. Oh, these are bad. <laughs> My question has to do with spinning back fists and their disappearance. Uh, was this just a t 2008 cheese technique used by the Affliction shirt wearing, juice using, no boxing having generation? Uh, what do you see its place in MMA as uh, a quirky rabbit hole, uh, uh, a quirky rabbit in the hat for a few unorthodox fighters, or something more? Much love from Canada, your Patreon boy forever, Stefan or Stefan. Uh, spinning back fists, surprisingly. When Paul Felder landed one, the other, uh, when was that? That was only a few years ago. That was his UFC debut against Danny Garcia? I don't know. Danny something. Castillo? No. 
But when he scored that knock- knockout, they said that it was the third ever in the UFC. And I think it may well have been. They weren't. There haven't been an awful lot of spinning back fist knockouts in the UFC. Uh, Shoney Carter is the one that I remember. And then I presume there's another one in there. But there's been a couple of spinning elbows. Um Pride, obviously, there was that one that Dan Henderson landed on Vandy just before knocking him down. Um, and I'm sure there were a couple of, of them in Pride. They were more popular. Like, they were a thing that people... I think it's because you can do it and be dangerous, even if you're shit at striking. If you watch Tatsuya Kawajiri's last fight in the UFC against Cub Swanson, I think that was his last fight in the UFC, um, he completely devolved. Like, a guy who used to be obsessed with punching just stopped punching and just started running into spinning back fists the entire time. It was uh, agony to watch. Dong Hyun Kim, after he scored that spinning back elbow, just spun for the entirety of his next fight against um, Tyron Woodley and then got punched in the back of the head because he was spinning. Um, I think the thing about spinning techniques and what we're learning generally, you know, there was a period where everyone would try spinning techniques, like Vitor with his spinning back kick and shit like that. Um, I think what we're learning really is that from people who do sports where spinning techniques are very popular, like the point fighting guys. Um, you know, look at Raymond Daniels and uh, MVP. I think what we're learning is that they're very useful in specific situations and we're picking up on those situations more. You know, it used to be, oh my God, that guy can do a wheel kick, you know? <laughs> like that was the impressive part. Um, now the impressive part is actually landing them and that, again, takes some science. Uh, the best time to hit anyone is when you know exactly how they're going to be moving. The most predictable way that anyone can be made to move is straight towards you. So take a step back, they come in, uh, which is why you see in a lot of these high level point fighting contests, the spinning back kick and, and you know, the check side kick to spinning back kick and the wheel kick uh, are all used as a counter technique when the opponent comes in. Now, writing off uh, using them as a herding technique, like when someone circles out past your shoulder along the fence, uh, as Volkanovski was doing to Elkins, trying to hit him with the back fist and the back elbow, uh, if we just ignore those for a moment, the spinning back techniques as a counter, you're starting to see them more with, with the kicking techniques. It's quite hard to do a spinning back fist as a counter, typically because the, the range is going to collapse. The spinning back elbow is a better counter, and guys tend to look for that more. You know, that's an old Muay Thai technique that uh, obviously most of these guys have been training with Muay Thai coaches their entire lives or their entire MMA life at least. Um, so they will have had someone telling them how you can actually land that. Um, obviously there's other ways, you know, with the pummeling along the fence, guys are doing that more now like Volkanovski and John Jones. But the spinning back fist is in that awkward range where you, if you're going to connect with the fist, it's really only a small area you're actually going to be able to connect through, which is why they're so uh, controversial in glory. Uh, if you have... If you allow the spinning back fist, this happened in K1 too, uh, Andy Hook knocked a guy out with a spinning back fist and they banned it slightly later. If you allow the spinning back fist but you don't allow elbows, the spinning back fist is a technique wherein you are going to smash the guy with your forearm more likely than not, so you know, it's not really uh, a spinning back fist. But there is that very small window and you are giving up your back if you're uh, fighting in MMA. What does seem to improve the chances of landing a spinning back fist, and certainly a, a far more practical use of the spinning back fist is off a missed kick or off a dragged kick. Uh, if you throw a round kick and you miss and the opponent comes back in, or if you throw a round kick and they catch it and drag it across themselves and try to step in, that's the time to spin. And you'll watch people like, um, well, the Korean Zombie knocked out some much more accomplished kickboxer doing that, even though back fists were illegal in that fight. Um, Reina Kabuto, who I'm writing about this week, in fact today, uh, she does it a lot. Kung Lee used to spin off his kicks all the time. You know, uh, it's actually a really interesting clip of Quan Kicker, who's a guy who, like, taught taekwondo kicks on YouTube. Um, but there's an interesting clip of him at some Muay Thai camp just talking about how if you miss a kick, you're in position to spin anyway, so it's a great chance to try and land spinning techniques, uh, whereas trying to land them off the bat is is much trickier. And that goes back to what we were saying, like, what, one of the few times you know the opponent is going to move in on you is when you've missed a kick because you are in bad position. Uh, so I, I really like it as a counter technique slash get out of jail technique. Um, typically when you see guys using it, it, they're going to the well because they don't have that many other ideas or they're just trying to mix it up a bit. And in those circumstances, they don't tend to work as well. I think really they are a great punishment for aggression when you're in a bad position. We'll probably see someone else knocked out with a back fist just out in the open at some point, but I think 
you're going to see guys hurt with them when they're stepping in. Um, Kung Lee actually used to do it a lot, and he caught Frank Shamrock. He hit him with a side kick, and it... Uh, oh no, it was a hook kick he went for, and you know it's very hard to land a hook kick on a guy with his guard up. Uh, so he ended up stepping down from it, and as Shamrock was closing in on him, um, he turned and hit him with the back fist. I think he knocked him down with that. Can't remember. It was a good fight. I'll have to watch that again. Actually, I think it's something you'll see more with uh, a lot of Sha- Sancho guys and and Chinese fighters who have Sancho backgrounds or some kind of combative kick. Uh, kung fu sort of background i say kung fu chuan fa whatever you want to call it Quan fa there's a hundred different names for chinese martial arts generally but i think that'll be interesting when we see more guys like song song yudong i've seen song i swear i've seen song yudong attempt a spinning back fist off a missed kick at some point uh, i've been watching a lot of chu uh Jian liang terribly butchered that name but he's the well, Combat Press has him at the number one as a featherweight at the moment, just above Robin Van Roosmalen. A very good Chinese kickboxer, probably the best Chinese kickboxer in the world right now. Uh, I'm writing about him soon. But in the course of studying him, uh, in addition to all this weird Ippo Macanucci stuff that he does, like weaving his head side to side as he walks in, um, he will throw out kicks seemingly in order to miss them and spin. And he's always hoping to land like a big wheel kick. He, he threw one coming out of a clinch once and knocked the guy out, which was really impressive. And it just shows that the best time to throw spinning shit is when people don't expect it. When If you are known for spinning shit, you are never going to catch someone cold out in the middle of a striking exchange. You've got to do something where they feel like they've got the advantage or you've got them in a weird position where they can't move properly. But yeah, I hope that answers your question a little bit. There, there really haven't been that many in the UFC. Um... I'm sure as better strikers come in, we'll see more of them landing uh, just uh, in in those sort of situations that we talked about there. Right, I reckon that'll do us for today. We'll be back on Thursday to look at the fights in the at the weekend. We'll talk um, Rising Eleven, which I'm really excited for. You've got Kyoji in action against o- Okibuk, the guy, the guy with the Sakuraba face from Tough, who is I think he's the only fighter from Tough to what was it win all his fights or make it to the final or something and not get offered a fight in the UFC, which is quite quite kind of weird um or, or someone like who, the only one who won a fight on the season and wasn't invited back or something like that fuck divino i don't watch tough but uh they've also got reina and uh kana uh, what's her name asakawa uh, the 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 one who actually looks like a schoolgirl and the one who could be a schoolgirl but is actually 27 so it's totally okay to fancy her and a ton of other stuff on that card too so it should be good and i don't think tension's crushing a scrub on that card either so <laughs> that'll be good um and then we got that great UFC event at the weekend with, I mean, I, I've gone in through the entire podcast without mentioning Aldo versus Stevens, which is a great fight, and Ioana Ian Jacek versus Tisha Torres, which has Ioana Ian Jacek in at least. <laughs> so we'll be, we'll be back on Thursday to talk about that. If you want to get in on the history episodes, we've got a K1 early edition coming up uh, in, a, in a few days. Uh, I've been watching some Don the Dragon Wilson, actually, to get prepared for that, because while he wasn't in K1, he had recent victories over two of the men who were invited, uh, Mo Smith and Branko Sikatic. So talking about that has, well, putting that episode together has been great fun. Love a bit of the dragon. So if you want to get in on the history episodes or support the podcast, or both, preferably, uh, get in on the Patreon. Uh, if you want to send an email to the podcast and have it read on air and I'll answer your questions and stuff, fights gone by podcast at gmail.com. All the stuff I do goes up on the Fight Primer, fightprimer.com. I'm Jack Slack, and I will catch you on Thursday. Be back here then. Cheers.